Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship today. We say happy Transfiguration Sunday and also happy Valentine's Day. We're so glad that you have allowed us to come into your space today via technology and glad to welcome you into this sanctuary via technology. We all long for the day when we can be back and worship safely and um, I'm glad to have this way that we can communicate with you. I call your attention to the announcements that you'll see in the attached bulletin to the service. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and our Ash Wednesday service will be virtual. Beginning at noon on Ash Wednesday, you can access it through the website and through our Facebook page, and I believe that also means it's on YouTube by noon and then throughout the rest of the day. Again, a reminder, do not mix water with fireplace ash to use. We've given you some sand in your Lenten packet. There's dirt, there's um, candle wick ash, all kinds of things, but just don't do that fireplace ash. Speaking of the Lenten packages, we hope that you'll have those by Wednesday. If you don't have them by now, let us know if you get to Wednesday and don't have one, and we will make um, sure that we can get you one. I want you to also know that beginning next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, there will be a conference-wide study, book study, on a book called The Color of Compromise. It's a Lenten book study on racism. If you'd like to participate in that, please mark 7 to 8.30 the next several Sundays on your calendar. When you get the e-blast tomorrow, you'll have the link. You can also see that on our Facebook page and website, or you can call the church office, and we'll try to get you into that study. And now, may we worship God together.
morning, boys and girls. We're glad that you are listening in as well this morning and um, hope that you will have together by Wednesday your little um, Lenten calendar to get us to Easter. You can see the variety of things on there that Ashley has put for you to do or for you to read, so we encourage you to do that. Next Sunday morning, we will begin our Lenten series, and, um, and we're hopeful that that will bring meaning as we walk toward Easter. This morning, we have a guest preacher, our bishop. He has prepared this sermon for the entire conference for all who want to use it. And so we wanted to do this as we close out this epiphany season with transfiguration and move forward. Also this day, as you're sitting around your lunch table or your dinner table, why don't you talk about the different ways that you show love to one another? Because that happens in a lot of different ways, and it would be wonderful to share among your family or your little COVID pod who, um, how you share love with one another. There's another special Sunday this is. It's amazing that we have so many things on the same day, but today is also Scout Sunday. And we have a scout troop, a venturing troop. So please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for these boys and girls and all the children of the world. We thank you for a congregation that cares for them and shows them that care in many ways. We thank you, O oh God, for love and ask that you help us to share it not only to one another, but to share your love in our community, in our schools, and throughout the world. Enjoy this Scout Sunday video. Since the pandemic shut down many activities, our troop has been doing a mixture of online and in-person meetings during the warmer months. Since it has been cold, we have done all online meetings where we have done scout skills for our new scouts and we have done merit badges. We have had a few COVID safe campouts this year, including a bike trip in July, where we went from Xenia to Springfield and back. Um, we worked a scary trail in October. In November, we did a rifle shooting campout where we were able to shoot and learn how to do rifles. In January, we did a Klondike campout where we pulled a sled from different stations and we had to complete different activities at each station for a set amount of points. In February, we are doing an electronics camp out where we watch movies and play video games. We are planning more camp outs for this spring and we are hoping to have a summer camp. We are also planning more online meetings and hopefully we'll be able to go back into in-person meetings when the uh, snow has melted. Hello, Reagan Senior United Methodist Church. I'm Tyler Zupfer and I'm here as a Senior Patrol Leader or Highest Ranking Officer of Troop 365. We at Troop 365 have been actively scouting throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, with our Monday night meetings being alternated between our online troop Zoom meetings and online or in-person patrol meetings in smaller groups. The smaller group setting allows scouts to work on skills they wouldn't normally get to in a troop setting. Other events that we've had this fall have been our skills camp up, in which younger scouts got the opportunity to take their skills that they've learned over the course of 
their time in scouting and put them to, and use them to uh, to build more skills in the uh, in a campout setting. Another campout that we've had is our turkey shoot campout, in which scouts got the opportunity to shoot rifles, shoot bow and arrow, and utilize tomahawks and atlatls, something that they wouldn't normally get to do in a in a normal setting. On the, on the events calendar for this coming spring and summer is a spring break trip from here in, right here in central Ohio to John Bryan State Park, which will be a very fun time for anybody who goes. And it's a bike trip. <laughs> another, trip on, another trip that's taking place this summer is a, can, a canoe trip that's happening in the boundary waters between the US and Canada. And finally, our last, our last summer offering this summer is going to be our normal chief, Camp Chief Logan camp, uh, summer camp, in which scouts will get to earn skills and earn merit badges, and it'll, and it'll also be a very fun time. We, appre we appreciate the opportunity to do service in our communities. Through, th through events like the River Cleanup and Luminaries, we get help to give back. We appreciate all of the support that the church has given us, and we appreciate the opportunity to come to your service today on this Scout Sunday. And we hope that we can continue serving the church throughout this scouting year and beyond. Thank you for your continued support of the scouting program. As we prepare for this time of prayer together this morning, I remind you that whether we are together in person or connected by technology, and whether we share our prayer concerns aloud or hold them silently in our hearts and our minds, God hears and knows and receives all of those prayers that we carry. In that spirit, then, would you join me for this prayer? Winter storms a Senate acquittal, and vaccination questions. These seem to be some of the bigger headlines that have occupied our hearts and minds in recent hours or days. Other smaller, perhaps more personal headlines have been no less present for some, big or small, public or private. These headlines remind us that we are a divided lot, O oh God. Valentine's Day, Scout Sunday, and Transfiguration Sunday, this day holds a variety of emotions for many. 
Some are eager to honor their Valentine sweetheart, while others have recently lost a loved one or long to have someone to celebrate the day with. Some have deep ties with scouts and are excited to be agents of change and growth in the world, making a difference in the lives of others simply by walking alongside one another. And all of us, in some fashion, long to be transfigured by the knowledge that God has redeemed us in order to know ourselves and our neighbors better. We are all kinds of people, in all kinds of places, with all kinds of needs and all kinds of hopes. What a varied lot we are, O oh God, but each and all of us is your beloved. And in all of that, we pray this day seeking simply to love or to be loved, to forgive or to be forgiven, to accept or to be accepted, to seek or to be found. Stir us, O oh God. Move us. Renew us with your spirit this day and free us from all that hinders closer relationships with you and with others. Send your spirit upon us to make a difference in the world that together we might do the work of bringing people closer together in spite of our differing political agendas, pandemic uncertainties, and personal struggles. Work through us to set an example for others, an example that reminds us that deep divisions only fracture your reflection. Remind us again and again that reaching out and caring for the other strengthens your reflection among us in our everyday routines of daily living. Help us to never give in to hopelessness or to the belief that nothing we say or do can make a difference. Help us find small opportunities every day to encourage others, to show care for a stranger, and to stand against injustice. This day, O oh God, we pray for all those who fall into apathy, believing that ordinary people are powerless to make needed changes in society or in the world. We pray for those who, by speaking doom and gloom, deny that you are in ultimate control and ultimate unconditional love. And we pray for those who are Christ's representatives in difficult or dangerous places. Gracious God, some of us are committed seekers and some of us are committed followers, but all of us in our differences are equipped to make a difference in this world, trusting that our lives and our love matter. And so we offer you the collective prayers of our hearts and our minds this day in the name of the one who taught all disciples to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Unveiled, a sermon for Transfiguration Sunday. Hear now this reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly they looked around and they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. I found a snippet that made an observation about the Harry Potter books that says this, in the Harry Potter books, the students at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry have to take a course in transfiguration. There they learn how to change teacups into rats or flowers into candles. And to most people's minds, that is pretty much what transfiguration is. It is a change of state from one thing into something quite different. The Greek word, for example, used in Matthew's gospel about the transfiguration scene is the word from which we derive the English word metamorphosis. And that word likewise conjures up caterpillars turning into butterflies or as Franz Kafka characterized it, waking up one day only to discover he had turned into a giant beetle. Jesus clearly was taking three of his disciples on what we would call a small group experience, a short retreat, overnight, I don't know. Trying to explain transfiguration, by the way, in using the categories of rationality and science alone is a futile exercise in all likelihood. You will note that the text that I just read does not try to explain, to persuade, or to convince about transfiguration. It only reports and describes an experience. I love the writing of Anne Lamott. One of my favorite books is Help, Thanks, Wow, Three Essential Prayers, well worth your reading if you have the time. And so in thinking about her wow as one of the essential prayers of the human experience, I wonder if transfiguration is about the wow. All of us have had wow experiences. Someone walks by and they are dressed to the nines or they are stunningly beautiful in some way. We go to a mountaintop literally and we look out and we see the majesty of creation. We look up at the giant redwood trees or we look from the bottom up at the height of mountains varying all around the globe. We go to a flower garden. We see a butterfly. We see a magnificent bird brightly colored. We look into the constellations of the night and sometimes the only response is to say, wow. I'm not suggesting that there are not explanations and ways of understanding height and depth and coloration. I am saying that the appropriate and likely first response is wow. And maybe that's what leads scientific minds to know more, to understand the how did it get this way. All of us, all of us have had wow experiences 
And I want to say to you, transfiguration, likely for Peter, James, and John, was one of those wow moments, even though they may have wanted to say something, the first thing was wow. How did we get here? Why us having this experience? I want to say to you that all of us need the wow experiences of our lives, and we need them in the context also of our Christian life, faith, and experience. Not so much the wow that scowls and wrinkles the face, the wow of disappointment. Wow, I can't believe you said that, but wow, are you serious? Are you kidding me? The wow of coming to know that you have been loved with an everlasting love. That you're in, that you are included. And in spite of what you think about yourself or what others have told you about yourself, the wow of the discovery, the realization, the revelation, the internalizing that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. What if more people had wow experiences when they encountered the Christian community? They would be transformed and transfigured by it. And the closer we dwell to the heart of God, perhaps we'll have more wows and we will invite more people into the wow moments of life. I like that movie Hitch with Will Smith. And he says that, Life and love are not about the number of breaths you take, but about the experiences and the moments that take your breath away. And Lamont says, wonder takes our breath away and makes room for new breath. <laughs> it's like she's saying wonder is about the wow that leaves us breathless even if just for a moment. She continues, this is Anne Lamott again, when we are stunned to the place beyond words, we're finally starting to get somewhere. When an aspect of life takes us away from being able to chip away at something until it's down to a manageable size and then to file it nicely away, when all we can say in response is, wow, she says, that's, that's a prayer. So transfiguration is about the stunningly beautiful wow moments of our lives, but it's also about the light. Do you hear the description? He appeared to them dazzling in white, bright garments, such as could not be bleached on earth. Transfiguration is about something being revealed. It's almost about blinding light. <laughs> and yet not quite blinded that we can't see that something special is going on. Transfiguration, and turning to Anne Lamott again, is in thinking of it as light. Light reveals, she says, us to ourselves, which is not always so great if you find yourself in a big, disgusting mess, possibly of your own creation. But like sunflowers, she notes, we turn toward light. And in this light, we can see beyond shadow and illusion to something beyond our modest receptors, to what is way beyond us and deep inside. Transfiguration is about the light shining in such ways that we see not only the triune God, but we see our own lives in that light, revealed, bathed, purified, transformed, I would say all of the above. As the disciples watched the dazzling Jesus, they also observed him in conversation with Moses and Elijah. And the question is begged, what's that about? <laughs> Is it about the past as prologue? You know that saying, what is past is prologue. In contemporary use, the phrase stands for the idea that history sets the context for the present. And the quotation about past as prologue is engraved on the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. 
I think that conversation that they observed, maybe overheard, eavesdropped on a little bit, is a reminder that while Jesus is distinct from Moses and Elijah, there is continuity if one sees it in the larger redemptive mission of God and the salvation story of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. This is a continuing, unfolding story it comes to a particular consummation and summit in the life, death, and resurrection. But Jesus never completely unhinges himself from his own heritage, though he does claim for himself that he is the fulfillment of all that has been foretold ahead of his coming. Peter knows in this scene that something special is happening, especially when he sees Jesus in conversation with Moses and Elijah. And his response, I think, not knowing what to do, but I'm only an armchair analyst. <laughs> but Peter always seems to need to have something to say, like so many of us, even if we don't know what to say. We don't know quite how to let it go at while. So he says, Master, it's good that we're all here. I say that might be his way of saying thanks for this small group, this retreat experience. But he wants to freeze frame the moment. He wants to enshrine the moment. And he says, out of his own recognition that something unique and special and important is happening here, let's build three booths, let's build three dwellings, let's build three huts, let's build three tabernacles. One for, the, for each of you. Almost before that conversation or that idea can go anywhere, this cloud overshadows them and they hear a voice that says this, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Message, there is continuity, but now I need you to pay attention to Jesus. I need you to pay attention to Jesus. Do you, does the church, do I sometimes stumble, fail, fall because I have actually ceased unknowingly, unwittingly paying attention to Jesus? You remember how popular it was, oh, 15 years or so ago, and occasionally you see them, the little wristbands and buttons and other things, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Sometimes, friends, I don't even want to ask because I don't want to know the answer because I think it demands too much of me and from me. But the invitation still comes from the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. This is the chosen one. Listen to him. Pay attention to him. Don't get caught up in the disorder and the scatteredness of our inability to focus. Keep our eyes, this text reminds us, on Jesus. And watch him in all of his movements. And watch this now. And don't ever think you've got it all down. No, on this journey, we keep seeing more, peeling back more layers because we keep applying what it means to be a servant and a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ to more and more contexts and situations that we've never seen before or that are not spoken of explicitly in the Holy Scriptures. And we've got to stay deep in the well with our eyes fixed on Jesus saying, now, Jesus, what to do in this situation? And finally this, as they're coming down from the mountain, all retreats have to end, all small group experiences end after 60 or 90 minutes or whatever, and you come back again the next week. Jesus does something that seems strange, but not uncharacteristic, particularly in the Synoptic Gospels, and I would say in Mark. <laughs> he says, don't tell anybody about this until the resurrection. What? Are you serious? You want us to keep this unique experience to ourselves? 
I mean, after all, when you've had a unique experience for which you've been invited and singled out, you want to tell somebody because you want to feel special. No. Cool it. It's not his direction not to live their lives fully and to live them to his glory. It is sit with this a little while. Watch the whole unfolding of this ministry. Watch the moves that I continue to make. Not just the exorcisms and the healing and the teaching and the proclamation, but watch my suffering, my dying and my rising again. And then you will have the whole picture of what your life is supposed to be like. Are we a church that teaches and preaches and heals and embodies dying to one thing in order to rise to another? Sit with it a while. Let it marinate. Walk around it, look at it, let it look at you. We need to be confident in the work that we do because we have reflected deeply upon who Jesus is for us, for the church, and for the world. The hymn writer says, open my eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine, open my ears. The next verse goes on to say. <laughs> Voices of truth. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Sit with it a while. <laughs> Open my mouth and let me bear tidings of mercy everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier, may it be so.
May we continue to ask God to open our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our hearts to the wow moments that God puts before us. Stay safe and be open to God's wow.